got the joy of the Lord? If you do, you have strength. <laughs> and you know we need strength, amen? We need lots of strength to make it through each and every day. And I don't know about you, but praising is a good way to get some strength from the Lord to understand who we are and to know that we have the joy of the Lord that is our strength so much. We are overflowing in joy. Uh, the Lord doesn't give sparingly, but He's an abundant God. He's a generous God. He's a God of overflow, a God of so much more. He knows exactly what we need. He knows what you need tonight. And so the Word is what we need tonight. Amen? We need each other tonight. We need the love of God that's found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And uh, I'm excited about that. Check out your bulletin for lots of good opportunities going on in the house of God, in this region, in this community, in this church. Check us out online in the bulletins. And um, we're happy to uh, have you here tonight. Well, uh, I have the opportunity to share the word with you tonight. So this is something I don't usually get to do. And... Um, I really appreciate this. Uh, Pastor Jim had asked me a, a while back to do this, and uh, I said yes. And uh, it was a very easy yes, and some things aren't easy to say yes to, but this is. I believe that the Word works. I believe the Word works. I believe the Word is useful. I believe the Word speaks to us. God knows exactly what we need, and His Word will deliver that to us. And uh, I just pray that uh, what God laid on my heart will be uh, of value to you. I pray that I can instill into you, and the word instill means to introduce drop by drop, and that's how we're going to do it here tonight. Drop by drop, drip by drip, I'm going to help instill the Word of God into you as the Holy Spirit leads me here tonight. I'm humbled and honored to deliver His Word um, tonight. I want to bring to you a message of hope I want to be a messenger of encouragement to you tonight. Um, God's Word is an encouragement to me. And every time I get a chance to share wherever I share, God has already worked me over pretty strong about these topics and these subjects. So um, I will say I know a little bit about what I'm talking about because God has already talked to me many, many times about what we're going to talk about, if you know what I mean. And so I'm thankful for that. I receive His instruction. I also receive His correction. Um, I have received the Holy Spirit's voice in my life, so I pray that you would do that through the word that's going to be shared here tonight. One of the things that I get to do is be involved in Bible to School. It's an active ministry uh, here at the Greater Johnstown Christian Fellowship that um, is an extension of who we are, and Bible to School meets the needs of elementary school uh, children, uh, ages or grades two, all the way up through five and soon to be sixth in what they call the Laurel Highlands, where we are. And uh, there's hundreds of children that come, and many of those children that come don't even know the Lord. And I get a chance to share um, some lessons with them and, and some of the Word with them and stories and a little bit out of my own life. And I was on my way, I was sharing yesterday, I was on my way up the steps to Bible to school, and it just hit me. It's like, wow, what an awesome privilege I have to do this. And you don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't even have to be on staff to share the word. And so you are the light. You are the salt of the world. You've got the word in you. It's in you. It's close to you. And so I encourage you that uh, I hope that it brings joy to you and that you share that uh, without reservation. So it's from this place we're going to begin tonight that Jesus asks us, you and I, as the body of Christ, the church, to do things, but ultimately I believe the things that God asks us to do is in order to release the power of the kingdom of God. It's not just ordinary, simple things of no value. When God asks you to do something, He gives you something to do, I believe it is of very high value. It's very important. And the impact, I believe, is very great. So tonight I want to talk to believers. How many believers do we have in the house of God? All right, all right. Pastor Terry Nipple says this, preachers got to preach. So if you mind if I preach a little bit tonight, I hope that's okay. Lord, I just pray that you would hide me behind the cross, that you would use the words that I'm about to speak here, the words that you have already given to me. Well, that they would fall on fertile soil, 
good ground. Lord, that we would receive it. Lord, I pray tonight that our eyes would be up and our ears would be open to see Jesus and to hear what Holy Spirit is saying to us. I pray that our thoughts tonight would be focused on you because we know that our thoughts influence our lives. So I pray that our hearts would be attentive, our spirits would be filled. May we touch you, Father. May we touch heaven tonight because your words are a lamp that guide our steps and a light that shows us the paths that we should take. So I pray, show us, Lord. Would you pray that? Show us, Lord. Show us, Lord. We love you tonight. We love your words. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to talk to you tonight about flourishing. Explaining and expressing our identity in Christ through releasing the power of the kingdom of God. Who are you? Who are you? If I were to ask you that question, who are you? As a follower of Jesus Christ, I believe that your identity is something that you should be able to explain. I also believe that as a follower of Jesus Christ, our identity is something that we should be able to express. Because when we know who God is and what God does, we will know who we are and what we are to do. Paul reminds us that we have wealth. We have become wealthy because Jesus is all that we need. It's through God's overwhelming grace that provides all that we need. And it's from this place of identity truth that you and I can overflow with abundance in every good thing that we do. We are chosen, beloved, and called of the Lord. But why is it important for us to know who we are in Christ? Well, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. I believe that when we know who we are, it helps us to do a few things. It helps us know how to live, number one. It helps us to interact with others, number two. And third, it helps us in the way that we relate to the Lord. If I were to ask you, would somebody please pray for us? If I came around with a microphone and held it up to you, how many of you would be eager to, to pray right now live into a microphone among all these people, even in the balcony? How many would be like, yeah, I'm, I'm in for that? Now, how many would put your head down, you know, pretend like you're invisible and that I wouldn't see you to come and, and do that, all right? I believe this. I believe that expression flows from explanation. In other words, I believe that what we do or how we feel about doing something has a lot to do with how we view ourselves. So if you feel like you're inexperienced, you're timid, you're shy, you know you've never done this before, you're identifying yourself as such. And therefore, when I would ask you to pray, you'd be like hiding and, you know, hope he doesn't recognize me and just turn invisible. But if you really feel like you're confident and you know who you are in the Lord, you're strong in the Lord, maybe you feel like you've ex you're experienced in prayer, then you've actually identified yourself, or you've explained yourself, and then your expression would be prayer. So if I'd come around with a microphone, obviously, you'd be like, sure, I can do that, no problem. But I won't do that tonight. That's just an idea, to get, a, get an idea of us where we're going. Ephesians 3.19 puts it this way, that you will be filled entirely with the fullness of God. We need to be in Christ we need to be in Christ. The Apostle Paul, in his writings, uses the words in Christ 164 times. But for all you who like to do mechanics, it's not like tools in a toolbox or clothes in a closet. It's more like limbs on a body or branches on a tree or vine. It's about remaining. It's about abiding in Christ. And I believe that we can say that we are in Christ, and I believe that that marks our identity as to who we are. And we are filled entirely with the fullness of God. Psalm 34, 9, listen, says, But those who fear and respect the Lord will always have what they need. Apart from God, you can't do anything. 
But with God, all things are possible. I love the word holiness because the word holiness could mean special, sacred, set apart, where you are surrendered to God. Holiness is what distinguishes you from that which is not holy. And the Bible tells us that we are made holy by God and for God, in which there is a difference, a noticeable difference in you, what some would call an otherness. And there is an area of holiness sometimes we have to think about is in our minds. The Bible says that we would be transformed by the renewing of our mind, but it's not like changing your mind like I'm going to go to Dairy Queen or I'm going to go to the Meadows instead, which I personally prefer. It's more of a taking on another mind completely, the mind of Christ, where His mindset becomes the motivation for everything that you think, everything that you say, and everything that you do. And can I tell you this? Holiness delights the heart of the Father. Holiness delights the heart of the Father. You have the likeness of Jesus. Turn to someone. You have the likeness of Jesus. Tell them. You have the likeness of Jesus. You resemble Christ. And the way that you got that way is one way. The way, the truth, and the life. The way that you practice holiness is being in the presence of Jesus. Being in the presence of Jesus, spending time with the Lord. God makes us holy, but we are called to remain holy and faithfully devoted by, uh, to Jesus. And how is it done? By doing good things. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, listen, we are God's accomplishment. I love that word created in Christ Jesus to do good things, that God planned for these good things to be the way, listen, that we live our lives. Holiness is a lifestyle. Living in Christ is a lifestyle. It's a life choice. So holiness is our explanation, our identity, but holiness is also our expression or what we do. Good things, God things. But my identity in Christ entails some obligations. There are things that we can say. There are things that we can do. Jesus said to his disciples, freely receive, freely give. And he wasn't just talking about tithes and offerings or those types of things necessarily. He was instructing His disciples to release the power of the kingdom of God. They experienced it. Now it's time for them in turn to allow others to experience it as well. It's a see and do approach to ministry. If you have it, God gave it. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm has been lavished upon us as a love gift from our wonderful heavenly Father God. And we don't have to do this kind of stuff alone. We don't have to go out and, and, and talk to our friends or, or introduce people to Christ on our own. We're not left alone. Because the Bible says in Philippians 2.13, God will continually revitalize you, implanting within you the passion to do what pleases Him. We said that holiness pleases the heart of the Father. So I encourage you, think of how you can continue to live a life of holiness by doing good things, great things, God things that change your world and release the power of the kingdom of God all around us. Psalm 92 is one of my, one of my favorite psalms in all of the Bible. And it's talking about comparing and contrasting the wicked and the evil with the righteous people of God. And we see that the wicked people are shown to flourish for a while, spring up for a while, but ultimately they will be destroyed or cut off in Psalm 37, it relates to them as, you can look for them all you want, but they will be gone, remembered no more. There's a word in the Scripture there 
in verse 7 and in verse 8, but it says, you, Lord, are exalted forever. But you, Lord, are exalted forever. The psalmist understood that contrast between the righteous and the unrighteous. When he emphatically exclaimed, I will raise my horn high like a rhinoceros, and even in my old age, I will still have plenty of anointing. <laughs> plenty of anointing. Doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. There's plenty of anointing for you to do the work that God has called you to do. He says, my whole life, from a young person until now when I, I am old, I have witnessed God's provision and power in the lives of godly people. I've seen it. I've tasted it. I've touched it. I know what I'm talking about, the psalmist is saying. The apostles would say things like, we must tell of what we have seen and heard. How can we remain silent when it's time to praise the Lord? I love Queen Esther. She obeyed the Lord, even though she really didn't know what the outcome was going to be. But isn't that really what faith is? Isn't that about really living to please and serve the Lord, a life of holiness? That's real faith. So when I go from belief or explanation to the action or expression, we release the power of the kingdom of God. I love two things in this scripture, two other things. It says this, but the godly will flourish like palm trees and will grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. The godly will flourish like palm trees and will grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. Will is an auxiliary verb that complements the ordinary verb of a sentence to form a verb phrase. And it actually shows us timing, but it also shows us inevitability, that it will occur. It's going to happen. This is our path forward, flourishing in the house of the Lord. But notice, it's in the house of the Lord is where this takes place. Palm trees are incredible, incredible. Righteousness, endurance, victory, triumph represented. Stability, steadfastness, and strength. And I love the Lebanon cedar as well. It's a high quality. It's used for pleasant scent. Actually, it was made for the building of David's temple, the temple of Solomon, and suggested to be used in boats like Jesus would have been in on the Sea of Galilee. They've been planted and transplanted in the house of the Lord because I believe that transplantation leads to transformation. Transplantation leads to transformation. When I was growing up in Johnstown, in high school, I would hear all the time, I, I'm getting out of here. I'm leaving this place. All my friends were like, I'm leaving, right? I'm leaving. They wanted to relocate. They couldn't wait to get out of here. So I did. I moved out to Columbus in 2006, spent some time out there. Lots of people I work with, the same thing. They were from somewhere else. They were relocated. They were transplants from another city, another state, another country. They relocated just like me from somewhere else. In 2020, I relocated back here to Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And I realized this. There was a friend who was a pastor friend of mine in 2003 gave me a plaque. And it said four words on it. It said, bloom where you're planted. I still have this plaque. And it reminds me of who I am and what I'm called to do for the glory of God. It, it both shows me who I am, my identity, but it also shows the way that I express that in doing great and wonderful things for the Lord. We're not finished with doing the work of the Lord. How many are saved in the house of God? How many are saved and sanctified, washed, freed, changed? Yes, we are. And there's still work to be done. That's our redemption story, but it's a story that continues in our life. We don't stop just when we're saved, but we continue to be holy. We continue to allow that transplantation that God called us out of something into something better, out of darkness into light, set us up for success. Transplantation leads to transformation. So we need to shepherd faithfulness. Psalm 37 in the New King James Version puts it this way, to feed on His faithfulness. I cannot eat what I don't produce. Now I know what you're thinking right now when I say that. Well, 
I could just go to Aldi's or Walmart or Giant Eagle, Market Basket, Bilo, Ideal, Sheets to get your produce if you want to. They do have expensive fruit at Sheets compared. But I want to encourage you in this, to feed on his faithfulness, the Bible says in Psalm 37, 3. So the question for us, what are we raising? The answer is faithfulness. What is in your life pasture? Faithfulness, you're getting it. What are you tending to? Faithfulness. To produce means to bring about a yield or to make happen or to grow fresh fruits and vegetables from a vibrant, healthy, fruit-producing tree. And guess what? That is you. You never have to tell an orange tree to produce oranges. You don't have to walk up to an orange tree and say, can you please produce some oranges? I'd love some of those. It naturally produces oranges. In the same way as a Christian, as a believer, you are also producing fruit with the help of Holy Spirit. Fruit is everything done in true partnership with Christ where we are living in union with the Lord. We are the branches. He is the vine. And a fruitless Christian is a contradiction. A fruitless Christian is a contradiction because your fruit is simply love expressed. When we took a moment or so to take some time out to share the love of Jesus, you know what we were doing? We were expressing who we are in Christ. We were expressing the love of the Lord. We were simply expressing love as the fruit that God and Holy Spirit is working in us. Without love, everything else is fruitless anyway. Confluence, Pennsylvania is a geographical moniker so named for its location at the junction of the Castleman River and Laurel Hill Creek. And you know what river that flows into? The Yawk. The Yawkagany. If you've ever been to Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, the Shenandoah and the Potomac Rivers flow together spectacularly. And it's right here at the physical merging of these waters where we get the word confluence. It's where two streams and rivers meet. The way that we produce fruit, I'm going to share with you, is a confluence of two living streams. One of those streams, I believe, is the living stream of the life of Jesus at work in you. And I believe the other stream is your life. And when we come together in unity, in Christ, amazing things occur. Amazing fruit is produced. Amazing expressions are made. Produce is produced somewhere. Our fruit is the way that we encourage others to taste and see that the Lord is good. And that we can say, I know the one that I've put my trust in. I'm confident and absolutely sure that he'll protect and care for what he has entrusted to me. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lord has entrusted you and I to produce fruit and to be faithful. Isaiah chapter 5 says this, My lover in his vineyard. My beloved planted a vineyard on a very fertile hill. First he dug up its ground and hauled away its stones so he could plant within it the choicest of vines. He built a watchtower in the middle of it and carved a wine press out of its rock. He fully expected it to bear good grapes, but instead it only produced worthless wild grapes. We see this metaphoric passage of Scripture. Isaiah is writing of God's lover Israel and God's vineyard. In it, we're introduced to a loving master viticulturist who plants a vineyard with full expectation of harvest. And this origination, cultivation, and care of the vineyard was unsurpassed, the Bible tells us. His yield was to be the best and the choicest of fruits. He even built a watchtower and a rock-hewn wine press in anticipation of the fruitful harvest, but instead, the outcome was worthless, wild grapes. You know, you don't have to necessarily produce fruit, and sometimes we can produce fruit that is kind of counter 
we can go a different way. Even like the church in Revelation, hey, they were commended for some of the great things they did. However, there was one thing that they lacked. They lost their first love. The fire went out. Other things took their place. God was supposed to be first, but he became runner-up among others. I want to caution you. I want to encourage you to get out and produce fruit, but let's produce the fruit that pleases the heart of the Father. Your kids, your grandkids, your relatives, you know, we're all kind of producing stuff. We're expressing things in the things that we say. I, I sat outside of a high school waiting on my son to come out, and I heard a lot of teenagers coming out and swearing like it was their everyday language, saying things that, you know, aren't the best things to say, but maybe what they know. There's things that we do. There's habits that we get involved in. There's fruit that we produce. There's rotten fruit, lousy fruit, wild fruit. But we need to take an example and learn from the Word of God. We don't have to do that. We can say, Lord, I give you my life. Everything I am is yours. I'm following you. I want to be holy. Lead me and guide me by your Holy Spirit. And I believe that we will produce some wonderful fruit, some amazing fruit for the glory of God. This is why. Because we can release the power of the kingdom of God. We can release the power of the kingdom of God. Let me leave you with this tonight. Paul's letter to the Philippian church. He loved the church. He said, every time you cross my mind, verse 3, chapter 1, I break out in an exclamation of thanks to God. Each exclamation is a trigger to prayer. I find myself praying for you with a glad heart. I am so pleased that you have continued on in this with us, believing and proclaiming God's message from the day you heard it right up to the present. There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the day Jesus Christ appears. And it's not all fanciful for me to think this way about you. My prayers and hopes have deep roots in reality. You have, after all, stuck with me all the way from the time I was thrown into jail, put on trial, and came out of it in one piece. All along, you've experienced with me the most generous help from God. He knows how much I love and miss you these days. And sometimes I think I feel as strongly about you as Christ does. So this is my prayer, he says. That your love will flourish. And that you will not only love much, but well. That you will learn to love appropriately, sincerely, intelligently, circumspect, exemplary. A life, listen, Jesus would be proud of. A life that pleases the heart of the Father. I'm encouraging you today that there is such a life. I pray that you're living that life. And if you aren't, I pray that you would ask the Lord to help you do that. Bountiful, he says, in fruits from the soul. You know, what God gives you isn't all about you. It's for you, but it's also for others. Paul knew it. He said, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and the praises of God. May I encourage you today, get with the program. <laughs> get with the program. Start doing what God wants you to do, where God wants you to do it, when God wants you to do it, and the way that God wants you to do it. God's way is so much better than your way. I, I, I know this is a newsflash for some of us, but God's way is so much superior than our way. And the sooner we get to understanding and realizing that and living that out, the sooner we get to producing fruit and changing the world around us. So let's pray together. Lord, I pray that you would help us to do what needs to be done. I pray that every single one of us would become involved, active, and useful in effective ways for your glory to advance your kingdom purposes on earth. God, you are doing a now thing. May each of us move forward from the frozenness 
of the pain of our past, the yawning of our yesterdays, and the predicaments of the previous, and bring unto us the current right now moment of your moving. I pray in Jesus' name against the lies of the enemy, which place doubt and inferiority in us through false accusations. Satan, we say you are a fraud, you are a counterfeit, you are a fake. We refuse to lean into your lies because I am who God says I am because the I am tells me who I am. So I pray tonight that our expressions of producing choice fruit come from an explanation of, of who we are and who you say you are. Who we are because you tell us that. So I thank you for making us holy. I pray that we will live out holiness through being in you, Jesus. And I pray that we come in agreement with the inevitable accomplishing work that you have for us. And we let Holy Spirit guide our lives. We declare that we're going to bloom where we're planted and transplanted because we know that transplantation leads to transformation. And with your help, God, help us to shepherd faithfulness, to express your love and live godly lives, holiness, cultivating choice fruit, much fruit, and fruit that remains as together we remain strong, evergreen, and useful for the Master's work. You're doing it, Lord. You will do it. You are who you say you are, and you will do what you say you will do. So tonight we have faith. What you started in us, you will bring to us a flourishing finish. So right now I pray that we would flourish in your love, that you would allow our lives to be recognized for what pleases the heart of the Father. Bountiful in fruits from the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. May God richly bless each of you. Thank you so much for giving me your attention and giving the Lord your time. I know we're a little bit longer, but thank you so much. Uh, we did lots of singing. Y'all sounded great. The praises of the Lord went up in this place. They were incense to the Lord. So have a wonderful evening, and thank you so much for coming.